What is the meaning of life? That's the question we've been discussing for about eight or nine months now on this program. For those of you who want to keep track, this is uh, about the 185th uh, talk that we've shared together during this present year. And you remember that what we've tried to do is deal with the question from an intelligent, you might say intellectual, viewpoint. We've tried to look into the origins of the world and tried to make sensible comments upon the likelihood of it being a guided development rather than a purposeless chance development of undirected evolutionary process. We've rather taken the viewpoint that the order and design in the universe seems to indicate that there is an intelligent mind behind it all. Behind whatever process was used to create it, there was someone who designed direction into that process, whether it be an evolutionary one or not. And we then went a little further and said that that intelligent mind must be at least as personable as we are in order to make us as persons. Then you remember we took the further step of saying uh, that that mind must have communicated himself to us in some way over the years and years that men have been here on the earth. And we began to examine the men and women that have claimed to tell us what that mind behind the universe was thinking when it created us and what it had in mind for our purpose. And we examined the lives of people like Buddha and Zoroaster, uh, people like the Hindu prophets and like Confucius. And we reached the conclusion that they were all suffering the same limitations we were. They had never been off the world. They had never been off it. They had never been beyond the point where our radio telescopes can reach. They had never been beyond space to whoever is the origin of the universe and come back to tell us. Except for one man who is different from all the rest. And that was the man that lived in the first century of our era and that lived very differently from all the rest of the great leaders and great religious and inspired leaders of the world. But most of all, he died differently from them because he was killed, destroyed by the experts in execution, the Romans at that time. And yet he came back to life and lived on the earth for more than a month proving to everyone that he was indeed not a ghost, not a hallucination, but was really alive and was able to stay alive even though he had open wounds that ought to have let all the blood out of his body. And this man was, of course, the man we know as Jesus. And then we began to examine the books that record his existence because we thought maybe they're just mythological. But the more you get into them, the more you discover that those books that are known in the Greek as Tab Biblia, or in our English language as the Bible, those books have better documentary evidence behind them than any of the ancient historical records that we respect as truthful without any question in our minds today. And uh, as we began to examine manuscripts like those in the British Museum, Codex Alexandrinus and Sinaiticus, and then the Chester Beatty Papyri and the Manchester University Museum Library, we began to realize that what we're dealing with is downright history here, and that this man really did live and die and got up from being dead the way he is said to have done. And so we concluded that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was in fact the son of the maker of our world and that his explanation of the meaning of our lives is the only one that really matters because it's the only one that comes, as it were, from the horse's mouth. And so we've been studying his explanation of the meaning of life. And we've got to the point, you remember, where we've discussed the fact that many of us are dead even though we're alive. Now, that's a paradox, but uh, you know the way we explained it. In fact, uh, there's a poet called uh, Walter James Turner, an English poet, who died about 1946 and wrote uh, this poem. Is it not strange that men can die before their bodies do? 
and women's souls fade from their eyes? Tis strange, but it is so. Where have they gone, and what were they? Those gleams of tenderer light than falls from mere quick shining limbs and eyeballs merely bright. Undying fires, removing far their unseen presence, show, leaving their brightness on dead moons as suns less heavenly do. And even though you may say, oh, pretty pessimistic, yet it does describe what so often happens in our world today. We develop as bright little children, full of enthusiasm, full of life, and full of direction. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, we're like little dogs. Uh, if you see a little dog uh, jogging along the sidewalk or the pavement, you wonder, where is he going? But he looks as if he has a very definite purpose in mind. And so it is with little children. Often you think, oh, how have they got so much direction and purpose in their lives with so little really to do? Well, Often we were born with, it seems, a great sense of direction and intuition within. And then as life goes on, you remember how we discussed that we all look around and we see there are billions of people in the world and there's only so much corn and so much shelter and so much food and clothing to go around and we'd better grab our little bit to make sure we stay alive. And so we become utterly preoccupied with the security problem and we concentrate all our being on getting a good education to get a good job so that we can make good money so that we can have a good home and have good clothes and be safe from the wind and the rain and then eventually we try to build up enough health insurance so that we'll be safe from the vagaries of incurable diseases also. And so we become preoccupied with security. And most of us actually never get far above that. However sophisticated we are, whatever advanced degrees we've taken, it's amazing how we end up living like uh, the most uh, simple person in the whole world, preoccupied with how we can get more food, how we can get more clothing, how we could get uh, sh security for the food and shelter and clothing that we possess. And then, of course, we begin to realize that we are unique, and we actually are. But we see that none of the rest of the world thinks we're unique. And so we set about the whole problem of trying to establish our own self-esteem and self-worth by forcing it upon other people. And so we begin to dedicate our work life to being not only successful financially, but being successful in our reputation. And we are determined to make everybody respect us the way we ought to be respected, and especially our wife and children, our wives and children. And so we become dedicated to the task of making ourselves respected and approved of and acknowledged and respected and appreciated. And of course, that drives us crazy. Nobody respects us as much as we think we ought to be respected. Nobody treats us as unique as we are because they're trying to establish their uniqueness too. And there's not enough sense of uniqueness to go around between us human beings, among us human beings. And so we end up filled with envy and pride and jealousy and all kinds of ambition that we cannot control. But we are driven by those things. And then, of course, we feel, well, wait a minute, we're not here for long, so we'd better get what happiness we can. And so we look around and try to determine what makes for happiness. Usually it's blotting out suffering that makes for happiness. So we concentrate on having a good bar in the house, and uh, maybe some of us even go beyond that. And we try to get what little bit of exhilaration we can from man-woman relationships. And then on top of that, we try to buy faster cars or better speedboat or go to a, a better part of the Riviera. And we uh, find ourselves actually driven by these what we call needs. We say they're the needs we have for security and significance and happiness, but they become driving forces. They actually begin to be strings that control us as if we're little puppets and marionettes. And so after several years of this kind of existence, we lose a sense of who we are and what we really ought to be doing. And that's what we mean when we say many of us have died inside, even though we're alive on the outside. We're alive, but we're just robots. 
that are governed by our external needs and circumstances. And long ago, we've lost the sense of who we are inside. That's what we'd like to talk a little more about tomorrow, because that is one of the great problems of mankind, not the exploration of outer space, but the exploration of inner space.